Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to run through my development and a bit of the history behind it. Um, it's, it's uh, hit that, that should go to the next slide. So a bit of history, um, what actually started this project and, and like all projects, they tend to go for a few years and this one probably has gone for about three years thanks to COVID, had some spare time to, to do things. Um, some basics first, uh, 122 gigahertz, the wavelength is 2.5 millimetres, so um, obviously a few little things here, you can't use conventional uh, uh, antennas and things like that, but hey, it's, it still works the same as, as, as lower frequencies. Just that there's a few special techniques and there's an extreme lack of test gear and, and, and things you can actually use there. Um, the challenges are uh, we have some allocations in the millimetre wave bands that are, are there and because they have no real use to anybody else. Um, and 122 gigahertz is, is one of those. Probably this, this graph gives you a bit of an idea of the challenges of, of uh, water vapour, in other words, um, H2O, the various uh, uh, molecular bonds that, uh, that resonate at different frequencies. The, the well-known one for, for is 24 gigahertz. Um, 10 to 0 is 1, so this is a, on the left-hand scale, dB per kilometre. So for, for 24 gigs, it's around about 0.3 dB per uh, kilometre. 60 gigahertz is really bad. In fact, I think Syro was using 60 gigs or 66 gigs to measure the moisture content in wool bales. You can see why, because it can be anything up to about 20 or 30 dB per kilometre. And then a little one, a little, uh, I've got a mouse, fantastic, here we go. Um, here we are, 120 meg, uh, 122 is just past where oxygen and water. So uh, really humid day, we can get about one and a half dB per kilometre. So a bit of a saying on 122, you can quite often see further than what you can work. 134 gigs is down here. And interesting, in our recent tests, it actually works better. So project history, probably the first work of self and, and Ian uh, working on uh, 122 was using the DL2 AM harmonic mixers. A harmonic mixer is a really simple device, but 99% of it is a local oscillator and then you have a $2 diode that you've glued to a printed circuit board as your active element. Um, they work amazingly well, but it's about 200 microwatts out and a noise figure of about 30 dB. I think some of the, the, the Europeans, uh, Michael Kuhn, have measured, it's around about 27 to 30 dB noise figure, which is pretty bad. But like anything, it works. And that's all we had up until very recently. So Ian and I could do 10 to 12 kilometres on 300 mil dishes. The, the Austrians were the, sitting on top of a mountain when it's minus 10 degrees. The world record was between two of these mixes over 132 kilometres in 2013. And that's the best DX that we obtained with our fairly average mixes was 24Ks with one of these Uber stations at the other end on a very, very humid day. So the challenge was there to improve things. Um, at Friedrichshafen, June 2018, I was talking to Henning, DF9IC, who had been doing some commercial work with these new silicon radar radar chips. Now, they're... they're, they're there was there's several chips, there's more now, but the, the original chips had two applications. The, the one with the array, which I first worked with, which um, there was one out on the table, uh, for, for, for the drone market where they'd have uh, near-field radar in six directions, hence they had arrays. But the, the most obvious application for these is actually level measurement and the original chips of 24 gigs, but um, going to 120 gigs gives you a, a five times resolution in actual level. So they're mostly used for, for level indicators. 10 metre distance, that's it. Um, the interesting bit about the discussion is Henning was saying he couldn't get the thing clean and couldn't get it locked and all these sorts of things. So the, um, the chips are a compromise. They have a 60 gigahertz VCO. So those familiar with phase lock loop technology and those who probably played with uh, three CVs will know that they can be very temperamental. Around at the same time, Mike K6ML and, and Andrew started his design um, in 2019. I remember seeing Andrew's before, uh, just when he was doing the circuitry. And that around the same time, I changed roles and started working for a 
the current company I do now, where I'm involved in a, a design team and provide um, a, a bit of practical knowledge in EMC and PCB layouts and things like that. And it, it rejigged my um, interest in doing printed circuit boards again, which had sort of I'd left off probably with the equipment supplies committee when we split it and um, mini kits. Mark, uh, he was part of that. He he made that a, a, a really successful venture going forward. So got the first samples in, in June 2019 and didn't take long. Version 1, transceiver with IQ mixer was working August 2019. And in one of the AR firsts ever, it actually worked when I switched it on. And it was locked. So that was the amazing bit. What's happened since then is probably two years of, of actually making it better. So here's the original. Um, there's only, uh, I think there's only two still alive. I think Ian's got one still. And this is this is the, the first one. But the chip, there, there's the array chip, so a couple of patch antennas. Um, the, the, the advantage of that was certainly antenna efficiency is good. The disadvantage is because you've got to receive and a transmit patch there. They're about six millimetres apart. When you put it in front of a dish, your focal point changes. So it becomes a mechanical issue. Uh, and, and my K6ML came up with a sliding feed arrangement to get around that. Um, David 5KK went more agricultural and just calibrated a few notches on the tripod to lift it up and down. The other problem we found with this, I won't preempt the next slide, but we certainly, it was, version one became version two very quickly. Um, this one served purposes, but really was more of a testing ground for both Ian and myself to, to to just nut out what could be done with these chips. First thing we found was the polarising the chip when the writing is up the right way is vertical. And for us VHF and above operators, we know vertical is only for FM. The VCOs and the chips drift everywhere. They're at 60 gigahertz. So any heat, they go everywhere. So it would drop out of lock. So my original arrangement of uh, trying to be smart and using the... the, the uh, the lowest level VCO, which gave us better um, face noise um, performance, um, you, you almost had to, to jig it up and down. There's, there's, there's four pins, one's VCO, the other three are basically different ranges, which we thought were digital pins, but Ian discovered they're not digital pins, they're just part of VCO, just different scales. And this is the same for all the chips. So on the 3CB, the whole lot are connected together, it gets around it. We would instead of doing several gigahertz, just doing 190 megahertz per volt, which improved things, but we needed a better way of fixing that. The end cover, a very simple idea, just putting a pot and switching it, which fixed the problem. And the original Arduino Pro Mini needed a USB to serial converter. The, the, I, I, I took the, the Arduino off the board, and this is something, another thing, keeping processes away from sensitive VCOs is rule, one, you know, rule number one. It, 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 it actually worked quite well in keeping all, any digital artefacts that usually get in through the reference input. The reference input on these phase lock loops are really sensitive, so you just got to keep everything digital, switching um, all the way across. Just don't have anything that's switching anywhere near them. And then they work quite well. And my software is pretty basic. Um, Arduino sketch that I'd used in a phase lock loop, Ian set about and basically filled up all 32K of an Arduino. But th this is version two, which was in, it was in the 320 uh, Jubas and was reprinted as the, the feature cover girl on uh, Technic, uh, Technic 18. Um, and that's the one that's out there, actually. That's the, the original one that's out, which um, th there is a raffle to give away a 122 transceiver, so buy tickets, buy tickets. Then I started on version 4. There is a version 3, which I might talk about at the end. Of, uh, how much time am I, how am I going? Okay, cool. Um, so on version 4. Ver version 3 actually was the same as version 2, but with the processor on board, which sounded like a really good idea. But something called the component shortage came along. And if anybody's looked on mouse or a digikey and tried to get uh, Atmega 328 chips and you see that it's a minimum of 12 months delivery, 
Uh, I only ever made two, and I had to borrow chips off, off um, nano boards to make it. So went to version four, so version three. Um, the first thing, as I mentioned before, was that the, the, the patch antenna, while very efficient, is a requirement to move the um, between receive and transmit to regain fo the focal distance, effectively having to move it two wavelengths, which is a big deal. Um, so I developed a new RF board. In this stage, quite a few 3CV units are out, and I was, had a couple of people say, can you make a board that's compatible with the horn and the, the chaparral? Uh, we did some tests on the chaparral, and the chaparral basically, while it has a great beamform, doesn't actually uh, do much more than that, but the horns are very good and work exactly as they, as they should. That was an obvious thing. The TR120 chip is slightly different. All these chips are different. Whenever they design these things, they must have employed a new engineer because there'll be some difference in the way the pins work or the, the, the way the logic is. But what I end up doing is making a whole bunch of front boards that you can use any of the chips on, on, the, on, the, uh, uh, on the main board. Uh, the original main board was updated to 2.1 with the VCO pots as per Ian's modification and a JT4 interface. And the JT4 interface, reason for JT4, um, Ian's software simply looks at the tones and counts. And a four tone system works very simply. It, if you try to do it with 65, you'd need you know, you know, more software. The advantage of 65 is probably not something we need to worry about here. Um, so JT4 is very simple implementation. So the, the, it's CW, digital, or FM. Um, and then later on, this is now sort of late 2020, the uh, TRO-120-31 chip, which was the first 122-134 chip. A few people may be aware of that. Uh, a very famous amateur in Germany who might have just sold his business actually bought some for me to do some trials. Um, we, we live to public, are we? On this. Um, basically, the chips didn't work. Uh, there were trial chips and there were issues with them, so that really didn't go very far. I think Ian and I spent probably a year trying to get some sense out of them, and uh, the, what we found is on 134 gigs that there wasn't enough drive for the, the, uh, the, the mixers to work uh, because the, the amplifier they used for the LO it was probably better at 122 than it was at 134. Anyway, that's, that put things on hold. Um, the other experiments we did, and this, this is probably key to making any system work higher with lower phase noise, was using a higher phase detector frequency. Uh, originally 10 megs, and in the chip we could multiply it to 20, and that does make a difference in, in the, the, the nearby skirts. Um, OE2JOM had a, an article in Jubis, I think three or four, 2012. Very simple locking of a, a crystal. Uh, it was originally intended to drive those big bricks and things like that, but that was uh, what they'd done to improve the phase lock loop noise in their systems. Um, so I started playing around with the same thing, and that, that, that started to show some really good uh, signs. So the, the original version 2, you, you, uh, there's not many of them around, but if you're using that, even I think the 3CV, you could probably update it. You'd have to change the firmware. Okay, so what we call the 2022 one, which I started work on early this year. Um, the silicon radar chip then, the 45, which is the, the production one, was announced. Um, it was They were all produced late last year, but they delayed the release to May 2022. Reason for that is they tested every single chip after the issues they had with the 31 to make sure that they worked and make sure they tuned the range. Um, the spec sheet was rather vague. There's the only thing we found with silicon radar is they never had a version one spec sheet. I think the highest number was 0.8. It's always a worry when you're designing something. Um, and there was absolutely, all they put in the chart was the, the, the best gigahertz per volt data, not the actual. Uh, Ian did a little uh, program where we basically scanned from 116 to 135 gigs and found that the, the tuning ratio at, was something like three times uh, less at the top than the bottom. And if you're designing a phase lock loop, that's just a nightmare because the filter has to be really pretty tight in the, the spot. So anyway, we found a way around that. Um, while waiting for the 045 chip, um, I worked on the V4 board. And the, the V4 board, instead of the ADF4159, has an ADF4151, 
513, which is a new phase lock loop, works to 26 gigs. Not that we needed it to work that high, but it had better noise performance and sub hertz, uh, something like, it's like a 49 bit um, PLL. The, the original, we could get 38 hertz steps at 122 gigs, just think about that. Uh, the current one, I think we can get under one hertz steps. Um, so we used to round the frequency and that worked okay for JT4, but it, it actually is technically capable of lobbing on frequency within one hertz at 122. You can do the math on that. It's better than what we need, but certainly you could use it as a digital transceiver if you really wanted to do the, the firmware. The good bit was the test now, the phase noise close in was nearly 50 dB down in the, the first skirts. You, you typically get a bit of a, a camel hump out to the side, just depending where the filters are. But what was happening now, the original was quite good, but now all the power is going out on the carrier, which is an issue at these frequencies. Quite a lot of the early attempts, and doesn't matter whether it's mine or three CVs, most of the power is going out in phase noise. And that has a, a double whammy, other than the fact your transmit signal is low. Um, your receive performance goes out the down the toilet and if if you work the reciprocal bits out it just gets it gets to a point they, they just don't work um, and the, the the noise figure of this chip is is quoted as 8 DB but that's theoretical um, comparing some of these they were no better than a, a diode mixer and that was mostly because of the phase noise and all the reciprocal stuff um, and in June 2022 the, the chips arrived so it was a mad, I already had the printed circuit boards ready for about six months. Dropped one on, plugged it in, and it worked. And I think I got to end that night <laughs> to play with the software. So, uh, yeah. It, it, there's a, a fair bit of luck along the way. This, this, uh, at this stage, this was the 18th prototype from start to finish. And it, it's, it's, it's an, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the chip essentially worked as it should. So this is a quick slide. I won't go through it, but this is sort of the changes. So the change went from the 4159, which is the 2020, to 41513 in 2022. Uh, there's a little optional 40 megahertz VCTXO daughter board underneath, so that sits underneath the board. There's some photos coming up, which will probably explain this a bit better. Uh, that's locked to 10 megs, so essentially what that does is give the 40 megahertz uh, um, reference frequency instead of 10, that's doubled to 80, so that gave us approximately 10 dB improvement there. The VCO high band, low band adjustments. Uh, so that's uh, Ian's mod. More regulators. The PLL has three separate regulators and the loop filter has its own separate. There's something like six, six regulators now on the board to separate all the functions to keep the noise out of the phase lock loop. Uh, direct modulation, JT4, that works well. We just need to use it a bit more. <laughs> Uh, new RF boards for the front, so there's actually four now, so you can use any of the chips and the differences in the chips, uh, they all pin compatible on the front of the board and if there's any pinouts or logic changes, that's all done on the small board. The reason that it's on a separate board, once again, is to keep the noise uh, pick up to a minimum. Uh, it's it's T-soldered and right behind the chip, there's a great big lump of copper that, that keeps the, the st thermal stability better than what the original, even even the silicon radar test boards. Drop the operating voltage down to 6 to 7.5 volts, um, because at this stage it's now starting to draw about 350 milliamps, so dropping that on a board that's quite small in, inside of one of these, we a lot of heat. Um, the VCTXO we're using, you can actually use it unlocked on FM, and it's within a few kilohertz, but with all the heat in there it would start to drift, so we basically reduce the, the, the voltage down to six to seven and a half volts DC and then just use a separate external regulator. Um, the TR-002 version could be powered from one of these. It's a five volt rail, but nothing uses five volts on the board other than the Arduino, everything else is 3.3. .3. So this was another discovery we made playing around with the USB control, which we'll give a demo shortly on. And you can actually run it off a smartphone and uh, there's enough filtering, there's no change in the skirts or anything like that, works, works quite well. Um, and yes, I, the original was 0603, but I did dilly-dally and try some 0402s uh, just to get extra bypass capacitors around the chip. Probably made a couple of dB difference 
it's debatable, but it certainly uh, complied with the requirements of the chip. Okay, we have some photos now. So that's the uh, 122, 134, which is sitting in here at the moment. Um, it's, you can see that the, the chip sits on its side, so it's horizontally polarised. Uh, very simple matching networks for the I and Q, and that just goes to a, a, a mini circuits 90 degree hybrid to get the qubit IQ. So it is not double, it is single sideband. 3 dB difference, it's debatable whether it's worth chasing, but technically it, it, it's a, it, it achieves that. Um, so I like mucking around with printed circuit boards. This, it's a four layer printed circuit board. This is with the ground planes turned off. Red's top layer, blue's bottom layer, and all the critical tracks are inside between ground planes. Um, especially you'll see a whole bunch there, the yellow ones, which are the, the digital lines. Um, they're fully shielded, so the best effort, I think I call it, because you, know, you still have a, a, a process that's pretty close. Um, it's a pretty busy board, there's over 100 capacitors. Um, I make these by hand, but using stainless steel, um, stainless steel uh, stencils with solder paste. So, um, but I've actually built some of the earlier ones using tweezers. It's an interesting thing. I, I think I know the design pretty well now. It takes only about four or five hours to do one of these. But if anybody wants a project and their eyes are still good, you can, you can have a go. <laughs> Here, th this, this is a 122 only chip, so this is the, the, the best performance I've got. Uh, so it, it's almost 50 dB out of the, out of the noise. Um, when we started, it was probably about 20, 25, if you were lucky. Um, the, the, the power output is only indicative because the, the chip, there's no real way to really couple into it uh, successfully. It's, it's just a um, you know, waveguide over the, in front of it. Here we go, 134 gigs. My mixer doesn't work as well there, so the performance is a little bit less. But what we found is that it's, uh, I think power output's probably equal or maybe even slightly better at 122 because I've slewed it to that frequency. That's what one looks like. That's these here. That's the printed circuit board top side. You can see the, the white thing is the hybrid. Uh, the face lock loop is the, the square thing on the left hand side, and the chip byte is a le level. Converter, $80 phase lock loop. The last thing you do is hook up a $3 nano to it. So that thing is the, the fuse that sits in between to drop things to 3.3 volts. And the two pots down the bottom, one sits uh, high band, one sits low band for the uh, VCO. Underneath, that's the little VCTCXO, uh, which is in the next AR. Um, that produces 10 megs in, 40 megs out. Uh, and has some, some switching in there, which uh, if there's no 10 megs, it just unlocks the phase lock loop and, and runs straight. And the actual oscillator is that little bit next to the pot. You can see. That's the front board. That's the first contact head with the in, over 20 Ks, 5 9 plus. Um, it's amazing how well it works. And I don't know if this is going to play. How am I going for time? About five minutes. Oh, ten heaps. Good. Okay. So we, we will have a practical demonstration. Now this may work. This is from Mount Wellington when it was snowing. Okay, a bit of a warble on there. Normally not so warbly, but um, soon discovered that all the RF up there was getting into the 10 meg reference. Um, and there were some other interesting things happening, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. That's a contact. That was uh, 10, 11, 11.1 Ks, I think, to Rosny Park. Um, that was 134. I, it, it was that close. We couldn't do any comparison between 122 and 134. But uh, that's that system, system there. Ian Software basically um, we just connect to it with it using a, uh, a terminal program. So you can do this with a PC or you could do this um, using any one of the apps that are available for Android and I think iPhone has the same thing. So here's a screen. I'm just going to plug things in here. Just stand by. 
FT817. So what I've got here is called an OTG cable. So that's effectively a USB um, serial terminal. And the other end is plugged straight into the, uh, the Nano. Hit the connect button and I'm connected. And you'll see I am on 122.990.150. So what I've got across the bottom here is just some simple macro um, buttons. The, the software is set up so it just has some simple codes like F1, F2, F3. So if I want to change frequency back to 122.250 and we call the guys that are using uh, old mixers. There we go. So we're there. If I want to QSY to 134, I just do that. Now watch the VCO voltage there. You'll see it changes. It indicates every time you change. If I go to transmit, just hit this button here. You see the voltage is 3.49. Now this is a particularly good chip because the, the, the VCO range is, is 0 to 3, uh, 4.5 volts. We found a bit of spread with these. Some are about 3.8, some are 4.0. Um, so in software basically has a whole range of different things in here. So if you want a CW QSO and you forgot your key, you just hit the CQ button. And we, we can read 20 words a minute, can't we, Ian? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we'll call this beacon mode, the way it goes. I've got all these buttons set up here. So um, it's uh, Rex, it's modelled on um, on WSJTX, exact same messaging. It's uh, used for that. There's a few other things in here. If, if you want to know the commands, we just type in a question mark. And if I can find the question mark without my um, glasses, how about this? Here it is. Here's, here's the menu. There's everything for aligning is in here. So there's, there's different, uh, you can see the number of commands there. Uh, left hand side, so 21, adjust uh, 110, so that's one of the pots, so you're adjusting the range, so it just sits there and you, you tweak it and it's reading probably three, four times a second, the VCO voltage, so you just set that for mid-range. Um, the band limits, uh, I think this has option 26, toggles high side, low side. There was another one, we had an experimental one where we put it into scan mode and that's how we worked out what the chips we're good at. The good bit about this is because nothing is perfect with these ships and our filters do vary, is optimising the charge pump current. So we can do this on the fly. And, and on my um, tablet, I've just got all the charge pump current set up from, from 1.2 milliamps through to 4 milliamps. And this really helps helped us in the, the initial bit to you just look at the analyzer and just watch things push out, measure the power, see what's actually uh, once you can see that three or four settings, the power isn't changing on the main carrier, you know, you've, you've cleaned the noise up and that's all you need to do. Um, but there's other things you can set in here if your reference is, um, depending on what your reference is. Let's go back, hit RX again. You'll see up the top there we've got the reference is 40 megs, internal doubler is turned on, so the PD is 80 megahertz. Um, this chip is a 41513, we can go a bit higher, but 80 is, is, is fine, and the 40 meg chips um, oscillators are easy to find. The IF can be changed, so if you want to change the IF to 145, just bang that in, and it auto-calculates the, the offsets. Um, CW is actually FSK, so you see frequency 5 there. Uh, I'm on 134 at the moment, but let's go back to 122990. See that changes. All we're doing is shifting the, the oscillator half a megahertz away because that doesn't click. So it's, it's truly FSK. It doesn't matter. The, these things are duplex. They're, they're always transmitting. Cool. Okay. Now we might do a bonus thing. If you put a signal on over there. I'll drop this. Back to you, QSL. <laughs> okay. 
Okay